Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining to another awesome meetup finally happened uh, with Kate, Dr. Dr. Katie Borner. Uh, I'm really happy with that we finally did it. Um, so yeah, no further ado, I will introduce Dr. Katie and that will join us very soon. So Dr. Katie Barner uh, is a professor of engineering and information science in the departments of intelligence, uh, system engineering and in information science. Ludi School of Informatics, Computing and Engineering, core faculty of the Cognitive Science Program and founding director of the Cyber Infrastructure for Network Science Center, all at Indiana University in Wilmington, Indiana. So, and she wrote this amazing book that we have here. It's a very nice and uh, has beautiful uh, data visualizations that she will talk about today. Uh, so, please, Dr. Katie Warner, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and for making it happen a, a second time. So, please, the stage is yours. I'll add the presentation. Thank you, Sarah. It's a true pleasure to be here and I'm looking forward to an active discussion. So if uh, you have questions, I'm very happy to answer them in between uh, presentation slides. And um, if you have comments, please do use the comment channel. Um, Sarah already kindly showed the Atlas of Forecasts. Some of you might have it in your local libraries or even at home. Um, some of you might also have seen the Mapping Science exhibit. So I'm going to present on both of those and then end up with empowering all of you to do better data visualizations by introducing you to the data visualization literacy framework. And again, um, it's a beautiful day here in Germany. And I hope uh, wherever you are, you're safe and, um, and enjoy and truly ready to enjoy data visualizations. So in uh, the work we do at Indiana University, we bring uh, data visualizations, especially maps of science and technology and education and the job market landscape to public places. Here you see just some of the venues we brought these framed maps uh, to. So you see them at different conferences, you see them at universities, um, you see them in the CDC Museum in Atlanta, Georgia. And it's not just um, static maps, it's also interactive data visualizations. It's these illuminated globes by Ingo Günther and some other additional elements, even science maps for kids. Because oftentimes, if you have a family, there are kids. And so if you want uh, parents to be able to focus on data visualizations, you have to have something that the kids also can enjoy and have fun with while uh, parents might be reading text about the data visualizations. Um, this is an effort which has been going on for 18 years now. So in the first decade, we um, invited maps of science and technology every single year. And every year we had an international set of reviewers pick um, the 10 best maps. And then we worked very closely with the map makers to bring um, data visualizations that oftentimes were optimized for um, display in journals or in scientific publications uh, to a format a size and also um, to a general audiences, which oftentimes takes another step of translation. And that's really the value that the exhibit adds. And then we bring these maps to many, many uh, venues. The second decade um, is all about interactive data visualizations. And we are eight years in, two more years to go. And there will be a call for maps flashing on one of those many slides. And I hope some of you are working on your own interactive data visualizations and maybe consider submitting to the exhibit. And in this moment, it would become part of this set of 100 maps and ultimately 40 interactive data visualizations that um, are now in existence and soon will be in existence. And you see, it's not um, our team which um, does all of this. There are many, many map makers from around the world, uh, many macroscope makers. And of course, there's a rich number of display venues on almost all continents and uh, a lot of press surrounding all of this. And, and we truly hope that it um, empowers many to embrace the power of data, but also to um, open their hearts and minds to the beauty and the value of data visualizations. 
And I thought I should show you some of the maps. Here you have a map of scientific collaborations uh, from 2005 to 2009. Would be really cool to now add in the 2010 to 2021 data and to see how that changes over time and potentially also see what impact COVID had on all of this. Definitely less travel, but maybe more interaction online because it's faster. You can actually be in a meeting in the morning in um in Europe and then go on to a meeting in the US. And if you have stamina, you can uh, join at the end uh, something in, in Asia. Um, and you can also work around the globe now uh, in a virtual manner. I think we, we all are much more used to this now. So I think we will absolutely see a change in this map as time progresses. This is a map of grants, funding that goes to different areas here of uh, biomedicine. You can, of course, zoom into different areas like cardiac disease research or neural circuits research. And uh, you can also highlight what funding different agencies inside of the National Institutes of Health give to the landscape of uh, biomedical science. And you could even um, upload um, a new summary for a grant proposal and see if something is close by. This might be valuable for picking reviewers. So you could uh, select PIs of already funded work as reviewers, or you could just make sure that nobody else already has funding in that area, because that makes it much less likely that you will get funded. And over time, again, it's interesting to see that evolve and uh, change as time progresses. Here you see a map of science that was um, at that moment in time the most um, comprehensive map. So in 2005, this was the most global map of science. Uh, it's laid out using four spring embedding layout algorithms. And then it's turned and rotated in a way that um, you have mathematics as the purest science on top. And then as you go down the ring of science, if you wish, you go to computer science and material science, physics, chemistry, over into the greenish areas is biology, biochemistry, then to infectious diseases, immunology, oncology, medical treatments, the yellow areas now, neuroscience, psychiatry, over to psychology, education, business, economics with this appendix, over to sociopolitical and law, and then via statistics back to computer science and mathematics. So, so all of these areas of science are interlinked and connected and ultimately uh, give each other a lot of good knowledge and um, expertise. And many researchers um, kind of pollinate across the different areas of science. Some just sit in their area of science and drill deep and, and become more and more experts. But others are kind of weavers or pollinators across the different areas. And you could now um, really start overlaying the career trajectories of, let's say, Nobel laureates or career trajectories of those which become amazing science teachers. Where did they go before, before they um, um, were highlighted in a, in a particular way? On the right hand side, you have again overlays of uh, nanotechnology here, proteomics and pharmacogenomics, which are more interdisciplinary areas. And you now get to see where they are on that map of all of science. And by having this base map of science, you can again now also overlay uh, tweets about science, or you could overlay funding to, um, that is acknowledged in these papers. And so it's very, very valuable to have those base maps of science. And um, our team, and in collaboration with others, we have started to uh, create um, base maps that then are widely used um, in tools and in different um, evaluation and other efforts. Here you have a map of um, intellectual property. So who owns what intellectual claims and, um, and backyards, if you wish. And um, this was created by just plotting the um, top levels of the US patent hierarchy um, classification system. And um, it, it in total is 160,000 category. Um, the, Entire hierarchy has 15 levels. Not all of them are shown here. Uh, but you go basically from apparel on the top left to um, whatever is at the end of the alphabet in the lower right. And then you can, again, overlay different um, patterns here, for instance, those um, that are on um, gold nanoshells or on Gore-Tex, which is both our materials. And so you get to see how they are cited or what they are citing. And you can also, of course, overlay patents, for instance, by Apple and um, micro, 
um, soft um, to just see what kind of uh, intellectual property is claimed. This is a map of Wikipedia that's very near to, and dear to my heart. You get to see how much mathematics, science, and technology Wikipedia already covers. And it has a very important uh, role to play in translating science and technology and mathematics to a large audience and making it accessible to many. And so mathematics here is in blue. The science is in green and technology in yellow. Um, you also have four corners in which you get to see those articles which are heavily edited or which have major edits or have high popularity or have a burst of activity, sudden increases in usage frequency in terms of editing or accessing. And so you get to see um, one base map again with different data overlays. This is a map for all those of you which love science fiction books. Um, so it's very similar to Amazon. If you find a book that you already know and have maybe, um, books nearby might also be of interest to you because they're similar in topics. This map was created by hand um, by Vocelli and he has a beautiful set of other maps. So if you like this map, you might also like some of his other work. Um, all of these maps are available online on scimaps.org. And I hope you check them out because I can't possibly present all 100 here in the time I have. Going over to interactive data visualizations, you get to see some of them here and maybe some of you are already uh, familiar with them. Some of you might also have um, seen the exhibit uh, on display. I would actually be really curious to see how many of you saw it. I don't know if you can leave information in the commenting field, like where you saw it. We have been uh, bringing it to many, many different venues over the last 17 years, and um, you might have been lucky to see it this way. Um, we have a kiosk uh, display, an interactive display, which you can use to just um, browse through all the many interactive data visualizations. Um, you can then, uh, for instance, go over to Smelly Maps, which is a map of tweets uh, where you get to see what uh, kind of um, smell experience people had, for instance, here in London. And so the yellow smells are animals and they are placed, of course, right where the um, zoo is in London. And then there are emission smells, which are, of course, where the big um, arteries and streets are. Um, and then there are many green areas, beautiful parks, um, and those are the uh, botanical gardens and, and other parks that you might have near and dear to your hearts. And then what also was done with the tweets was a sentiment analysis. So you get to see where in London people are um, uh, in anger or in joy or in fear or are more sad. And I think it's giving you a new view of a town that um, you might live in or um, that you might have visited or might like to visit. And it's not just uh, London that's rendered this way, but also Barcelona and many other cities. So if you go to the lower left um, menu item on this map, then you can actually pick um, some other major metropolis uh, cities. Going to um, another set of um, macroscopes here, you have a so-called mega regions of the US map, which shows commuting patterns. This is all before COVID, when people used to travel up to two hours from outskirts of uh, New York into New York. And then in the evening, two hours back, that's a four hour commute every single day. Many of these um, jobs um, might now be all virtual and um, no commute, commuting required anymore. I think much better for the environment. Um, but what you see here are the commute patterns and they kind of rewrite the outer boundaries of um, the um, states in the US. So for instance, the state of Indiana actually typically has, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse pointer, yes. The state of Indiana typically has Gary, Indiana as part of it, but many people which live in Gary commute into um, Chicago and then back home. So therefore, um, the re-rendered uh, map of the states has uh, Gary as part of um, Illinois. And um, the same uh, happens also for some other states. What you can do in the interactive map is to zoom in to where you live or where you have visited before and kind of look at your local commuting patterns. Going over to another set, uh, we get to see um, the virus explorer, really relevant right now with COVID still going on. And you can now explore uh, different um, 
viruses uh, and their properties and their sizes in, in a very different way. And it's, it's simply gorgeous and beautiful. So I highly recommend you checking that um, particular microscope out also. And uh, again, thanks go to um, the many, many houses which contributed these maps and microscopes, and also to the Exhibit Advisory Board, which is around the globe. And many of these advisors also have local copies. We also have a set of ambassadors, which also have local copies of the exhibit. So if you are hosting an event and you believe uh, your event would benefit from having these maps and microscopes on display, just contact us and we would be happy to connect you to uh, the ambassadors and um, and also to the advisors. Uh, here is the call for macroscopes. So again, some of you might actually design interactive data visualizations or know others which um, are in that business. And um, every year we have these calls. Um, here the call for macroscopes for the 19th iteration of the exhibit. And the submission deadline is February 15th, which seems far out, but it's coming up very quickly, especially given the fact that it takes a world and a village to create one of those macroscopes. It's a lot of work and oftentimes a major effort. And so you can't start early enough to prepare for it. So are there any questions so far? Let's see, I can see some comments here. Um, are there any questions? Happy to answer them. If not, I will go over to the next slide. So uh, Sarah already showed the Atlas of Knowledge that was eight years in the making, but finally came out for last year's Christmas. Um, and it's, it's a great Christmas present or other present because it's it's very visual. And, um, and this um, Atlas of Knowledge was the one before and the Atlas of Forecasts um, is the one that just came out. It also completes the Atlas trilogy. Um, all the hundred maps are in these three Atlas books. So the Atlas of Science came out in 2010, the Atlas of Knowledge in 2015, and the Atlas of Forecasts in 2021. Um, all of those are by MIT Press and um, they fit in a nice kind of slipcase um, so that they're kind of a package and a bundle if you wish um, to have one of those. And in the Atlas of Forecasts, um, we now attempt to introduce a very general audience um, to computational predictive models. And some of you might be familiar with models um, of scientific data from weather forecasts or from um, transportation um, or uh, communication forecasts or from computer games, which also have a lot of computational predictive models uh, included, or Amazon predictions, Netflix, Net, Netflix predictions. But you might not um, know that you can also apply uh, models to predicting education developments or developments in science, technology, policy areas. And so in this atlas, you do have um, expert-based models. So you bring experts together and you run a Delphi study, for instance. Um, you can also have descriptive models. So you analyze past data up to today and you try to predict forward um, what might happen. But you also uh, have so-called um, generative predictive models where you um, look at, for instance, um, probabilistic um, models or dynamic equation models or epidemic models, which for disease prediction, I think you have seen those now with COVID going on. Um, there are game theoretic approaches, there are network models, there are agent-based models, there are machine learning models. So there are 10 models um, that are detailed here. For each, I have one double page spread, so not much space. And there are uh, formulas, and I'm very well aware that every single formula will cut my audience in half because people don't necessarily like to see formulas anymore. They had them in school and they didn't like them then, and they definitely don't want them again now. Uh, but there are still some um, which do uh, benefit from formulas. And I think there are many of you which can learn to read formulas. And so we made that actually rather easy and fun, hope, I hope. And then uh, as in all the other atlases, you also have um, part four here, science maps in action, where you get to see the eighth iteration, ninth and tenth iteration of the exhibit. Um, and then you have a part five, which looks at envisioning desirable futures because you can now predict all kinds of different futures that might happen. And then I think the main part that we need to get right is 
what are the futures that we all f feel are best for this planet, best for our species, and best for um, ideally all the species that are on this planet? And that's a non-trivial question to answer. And so, um, again, this is not just me. This is um, building on uh, collaborations with many, many teams and amazing experts um, around the globe. Many, many events led up to um, the writing of this atlas. Uh, but then ultimately somebody has to curate all this material, bring it all together and write it up. And that's that's uh, what I really like doing. And uh, I'm, I'm very glad that I have a job where I can do this on the side. Um, so here you see the different model classes that exist. Um, you have um, macroeconomic models, you have microeconomic models, you have uh, discrete event models. So these are all the models that are commonly uh, featured in books. And the models that I ultimately picked are slightly different because they just look at the type of model uh, that actually is applied. Um, on the right-hand side here, you have a very important uh, overview of how models are typically done. So you have some target systems that you try to understand better, uh, be it climate, be it uh, COVID uh, diffusion, um, be it uh, the uh, spreading of other diseases, or it could also be the evolution of science or the development of collaboration patterns or um, the changes in the job market. Could be any target model system that you care about. And then you have somebody who has deep um, domain knowledge on that target system. And that subject matter domain expert has to find and talk to a modeler. And that's not trivial because first of all, they have to find each other. They have to start to understand each other. And then they have to be efficient in communicating to each other. And that by itself is, is, is very hard. The modeler can then pick the right model and create a formal model, basically oftentimes just on paper or in a digital format. But then that modeler has to connect with a computer scientist who can then code that up or find a programmer who can code it up. So there are now four different people which have to connect and have to be efficiently collaborating and communicating to each other without information getting lost. And given that they all speak different languages, it's incredibly easy to get information to be lost. But then ultimately, the computer programmer has a code piece that now reads in all kinds of data variables about our world and uh, generates a new state of the world or multiple states, if you want a prediction forward. And these results, they have to communicate it back to the computer scientist, to the modeler, to the uh, subject matter domain expert. And again, many things can get lost or get misunderstood. And that's why this is so incredibly hard to get good models of science, technology, and policy making because of um, this uh, feedback cycle here. And oftentimes you need to do this multiple times because you want to zoom in somewhere or you have new data that becomes available. And uh, it's expensive also um, to get this right. On the other hand, um, having not a good model of science and technology is even more expensive because then you basically fund science in a maybe not so optimal way. Maybe you promote and uh, give career advice to people in a not so optimal way. So, so I think the other uh, alternative is even more expensive. So hopefully with the Atlas of Forecast, more people get to understand how this all works and how they can change it and make a difference. So the in, the, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna go through some of the uh, pages, but then um, focus on the uh, data visualization, which we see ultimately. So in the um, Atlas, you will get to see different phenomena of interest that you might like to model. You might like to model, for instance, oscillation or synchronization or tipping points or phase transitions or uh, adaption and learning, uh, reaction diffusion dynamics, networks, ne networks growth or network gatekeepers, attack and error tolerance of networks. So there are many, many different phenomena which have been modeled and there are standard modeling procedures for that. And there are many good examples of how this can be done. You can then also um, look at this modeling framework and understand how um, the process goes from data acquisition to modeling to visualization, which we will also see later. And then ultimately also include these modeling the types and the different ways to model. Um, model visualizations are incredibly important because they help communicate across these different layers. So from the subject matter domain experts to the modeling expert, to the computer scientist, to the 
person who actually implements the code and all the way back again. Um, model validation is extremely important because you don't want to apply models that don't have um, validation routines uh, behind them. And there's a lot known about how to do good model design and build and test and deliver QA. So, so you're not alone in this and you can just start, follow standard operating procedures basically. Um, and then again, for each type of model, you have a full page spread. Here, for instance, the one for cellular automata, um, which um, are a specific model class. Um, uh, and then from there, you have different model questions. So you could ask when, where, what, and with whom questions. Um, you have different domains. Here, we focus on the education, science, technology, and policy domains. You have different scales. You might like to understand the system at the micro scale, at the macro scale, or a scale in between, the meso scale, and there are examples for those. And then basically the book is organized by these uh, different scales and the different uh, domains. So you have micro education, science, technology, policy. You have meso education, science, technology, policy, and the same for macro. And for each one, you have a key example. And hopefully that helps everybody understand what kind of insights you can get um, from these models. And you can zoom into um, education or technology here. Um, and then the next set is all the many science maps um, and what they contribute. And then at the very end, you have kind of um, how to pick desirable futures. And I think one major piece that we have to all learn to better do is reducing human bias. We know there, this exists and we have to proactively counteract it. Otherwise we're just stuck with it and it's not good. Um, there's also a video that MIT Press did for it. So if you just want a little clip on all of this, um, that's available. We also recently uh, did a follow-up work on this where we looked at uh, visualizing big science projects. Um, so that's a perspective piece in nature, um, which um, I thought was really interesting because oftentimes we look at small scale uh, projects and how they unfold over time. But some of those big projects, they're like 30 year long efforts of a major communities just together plucking away at a, at a major challenge and then succeeding ultimately. And it's really wonderful to see how these teams form and ultimately perform and, and make major breakthroughs happen. Uh, we also recently had a Future of Learning and Work workshop at the Futurium in uh, Berlin. And we hope to have another event just like this. So if you are interested in learning more about modeling um, the learning and teaching landscape, but also modeling job markets, um, please let me know and um, we would be happy to invite you. And oftentimes it's a hybrid event, so you can travel, but you don't have to travel. Uh, also, for those of you which would like to travel and see Bloomington, Indiana, uh, where Indiana University is, um, we are hosting the next International uh, Society of Scientometrics and Infometrics conference. This conference has not been in the US for more than 25 years. It typically goes to major um, capitals uh, in this uh, world, uh, such as um, Vienna, Berlin, uh, Rio, Rome, um, I think was the last one that was the in-person last event. So um, this time we are bringing it to Bloomington, Indiana, because we have uh, 17 faculty members work in that area. And we have 150 network scientists at Indiana University studying networks. So that by itself was reason enough to bring everybody else <laughs> to Bloomington. And we are also uh, just very, very proud to, to be hosts of that conference. And there's a link in here. Um, and there's also a video about Bloomington. So please come join us. Um, those of you which like 24 hour events, that was something we did for uh, as a Christmas uh, surprise. And again, there will be another one this coming year that was just too much fun to not do again. But it was also very exhausting. But it was great because we had people from around the world really join us. All right, now over to uh, data visualization literacy. So some of you, I believe, are designing your own data visualizations. And I would be really, really interested to see how many are trying to answer when questions using temporal analysis and data visualizations. How many of you do where 
analysis um, using geospatial uh, data analysis and visualizations. How many of you do uh, what analysis, um, meaning you look at um, kind of linguistic text analysis, just like what we saw in these smelly maps where tweets were analyzed um, for sentiment, for instance. And how many of you do network analysis and visualizations? And of course, now you can also answer why questions doing these computational predictive models. And so I would love to know how many of you work in those five areas. So if you want to reveal this in the chat or in the comments here, um, that would be wonderful for me to see later. But in the meantime, um, let me just introduce you to our definition of data visualization literacy. So as you know, there's a lot of um, data and also official tests which are run in schools on literacy, the ability to read and write texts. So this is uh, these are standard texts which are run in almost all the schools, um, OECD and other major organizations also run them around the globe to kind of compare uh, literacy rates um, for different countries. Um, we also have tests for visual literacy. And of course, we have tests for mathematical literacy. And you need all three of those and a little bit more uh, to have data visualization literacy. And that a little bit more is basically the ability to, to go from the raw data to a data visualization, to basically map the raw data to um, XY positions in a, in a scatter plot, to um, shape and color and size coding, if you have um, that as an option, to um, other elements in your data visualization, including animation over time, if you wanted to do this. And that kind of visualization is not necessarily always taught, uh, but we would love to bring this more into classrooms because we believe that just like today, you need to be able to read and write text. We believe that you need to be able to read, make and explain data visualizations. It's too important for your personal life and for your professional life. So you have to find a way to take your Fitbit data and connect it to other data you have about yourself, for instance, health data from your um, very soon, uh, all kinds of bodily liquids data, uh, and connect it so that you get more information on why you see certain patterns and trends. And then over time, you might compare this with your digital twin kind of personal uh, biomedical uh, model and um, catch um, early onsets of diseases much better and, and counteract them much better. So I think going forward, we have that on the personal level, but of course also many in the professional life have to deal with a lot of complex data sets and being able to communicate those visually really helps communicate across boundaries, across borders, uh, across interdisciplinary um, gaps. Um, and, and so we, truly believe we need a better way to test this and to also empower more people. And uh, many people have worked on how people can read data visualizations. We are very interested to understand how we can empower people to make data visualizations. And so it's reading and constructing. Um, also, there's a lot of good work by Edward Tufte and others on how to do good data visualizations. But what we would like to do is to take human perception and cognition into account and also embrace fully um, computers. Um, uh, Edward Tufton didn't really want to do that. I think for him, the uh, hand-drawn visualizations were so superior over anything that computers could have done that he just didn't want to touch what was computer generated. And as you know, cartographers today still um, do a lot in a digital format but then spend hours in Photoshop to improve it. And so I think we get better and better in empowering computers to generate data visualizations that are aesthetically pleasing and insightful. And of course, if you want interactive data visualizations, you have to embrace computers in many cases. Of course, you can do minor adjustments by hand, but um, oftentimes with the flood of data and the amount of new data coming in, maybe not so much anymore. So I believe we actually have to embrace computers. And we can also embrace all that work that already exists in cartography and psychology and cognitive science, statistics, scientific data visualization in 3D, but also in the learning sciences to create a theoretically grounded and practically useful and ideally easy to learn uh, data visualization literacy framework. Given that there are new data sets and new visualizations becoming available almost on a daily basis, you have to have a highly modular and extendable framework. And so the framework we, which we created 
um, was developed by a, first of all, extensive literature review, 600 plus papers that already existed. And there are some heroic pieces of work, um, really pioneering work uh, that we can build on. And then we also used uh, an incrementally evolving literacy, literacy framework um, in the InfoVis course that I taught for more than like 17, now 19 years at IU. And um, thanks to the InfoBiz course, we had more than 8,500 students in this course. So we got a lot of feedback um, from not just IU students, but also people that are in the industry and that are coming from around the globe. And then we also had these students work on client projects with real world clients using that framework. And that also helped um, optimize the framework for use in the real world, in the wild, if you wish. And then, of course, we had um, feedback at the end of each course, we have um, forms that students are invited to fill out what they liked, what they didn't like, how we can improve it. And so that also gave us good feedback. Ultimately, we wanted this framework to support the systematic construction and interpretation of data visualizations. And so what we came up with in, in all the trials and tribulations we went through is this typology, which you see here on the left, which defines seven different types with four to 17 members each. And then on the right hand side, you have the workflow process, which has five steps required to render data into insights. And it has to be simple because we want this to be understood by anyone, my daughters, my parents, anyone really, not just experts. Um, and so you can um, label those uh, typology terms. You can then uh, put them, connect them to the framework process. And so now you have the stakeholders which have an insight need. You then acquire data and you get different data scale types. You analyze this data using different analysis types. So when, where, what, with whom, uh, or why analysis types, the models. Then you visualize the data using different visualization types, sim graphic symbol types, and graphic variable types. And then you deploy the data visualization. Oftentimes you see that you need more data or that something went wrong, uh, but you can also interact with it now and interpret it. And then ultimately go back to your stakeholders um, because they oftentimes then want to zoom in somewhere or they want to bring in new data or they get new questions, which is the best possible outcome that they start to ask questions which could never have been asked before and ideally also get answers for those. Um, so here um, you see this all in much more detail and you can now also see that just like in mathematics, when you get a kind of free form text um, question and you have to operationalize this into some kind of mathematical framework and um, formula, that also needs to happen here, right? You have a stakeholder just talk about what he or she needs in her personal life or pro uh, professional life. You have to operationalize this into something that you can understand and start to get data for, start to analyze and visualize. And later on, after you deploy your data visualizations, you have to start interpreting those and you have to translate this back to the stakeholders, ideally into something they can act upon if they can't act on it because they don't have permissions or they don't have um, um, the rights and abilities to act on it, then it's also not so useful for the stakeholders. They know about it, but they can't help it, right? Um, so, so that's the other part that you have to be careful about. And then here are just examples where you pick a visualization type, here a map of the US, a geospatial map, you pick your graphic symbol types, here nodes and edges, and then you add graphic variable types, uh, size coding, color coding, thickness coding. And so ultimately we developed a um, so-called MakerVis uh, environment where you can take data, for instance, publication data, um, and the publications are published in journals, which have a name and have a number of papers, number of sites, and uh, first year of publication last year. And then you can make a visualization. So you have this translation panel here in the middle where you can pick a visualization graph out of a set. Uh, you can then select graphic symbol types and select graphic variable types. And then on the right hand side, you get to see your visualizations. You, you see both. You get to see the data and the data visualization and the mapping in between. And we really believe that this is really important for teaching. This is not meant for reading in millions of data points and um, developing data visualizations at scale. This is a teaching tool. 
but you can do a lot of cool stuff with it. Um, so that's one piece that we use uh, in the information visualization course. Here you see the different um, data visualization literacy framework typologies. Uh, you have the insight needs, you have data scales, analysis types, visualization types, graphic symbols. And I believe you are very familiar with those. So you have geometric symbols, linguistic symbols, but also pictorial symbols, which not all the visualization tools support yet, but maybe in the future could support. You have many different graphic variable types and many different types of interaction. And actually a number of uh, PhD theses are running right now, which are expanding this framework in different ways. Like for instance, adding coupled windows. Uh, and then you take those and you can also just um, zoom into the inside need types, for instance, and you get to see the works which we were able to draw upon. Uh, so here you have Bertin's um, seminal work in 1967, and he identified those um, four different um, um, types. Um, and then other people came and had their own types and then uh, different tools. They also had to organize um, their user interfaces. And then this is the um, set which ultimately is used in the data visualization literacy framework. And then you can do the same for visualization types. And um, you have here examples of different visualization types. And it's not the case that there's total agreement among experts on what these different types are doing. Um, but in the interest of time, let me go over to uh, the different reference systems. So here you have tables, graphs, maps, networks. And as soon as you know that there is a column and a row system in a table, and an XY system in a graph, and a latitude longitude system in a map, and even in a network visualization, every single node has an XY. As soon as you know this, you can map onto this, and people have to understand this reference framework before they can even start reading those uh, data visualizations. But um, as soon as they have the reference, they can now do data overlays. They can add graphic symbols here for networks, for instance, and graphic variables. So it gives you a scaffold to just add on to. Uh, for the graphic symbols and the uh, graphic um, variables, you can look at them. And I think you are familiar with most of them. We also added optics and texture and motion, which again are not always supported by the existing tools, but are very effective. Um, you also know which ones are most effective uh, for human users, um, but um, we don't know this quite yet for motion. Obviously, something that's blinking is very, very visually uh, attention grabbing. Um, but um, I think there's a lot of uh, PhD works that can still be done to get us better understanding of when to use which graphic variable type. Um, you can also then tabulate the graphic variable types with the graphic symbol types. And in the Atlas of Knowledge, you have a much, much larger table like this. Um, and yes, you also see many of these combinations have been tried, but not all of them. It's like a table of um, the, like the periodic table of elements where you have some kind of open spots. And here, similarly, I think we still have to collectively understand better which combinations to use when. And I think that's my um, concluding slide here. So we have a um, visual analytics certificate course um, that we developed um, to make it easy for those in the workforce or those which um, have not time to um, come back to a, a university and take an entire course to uh, get more data visualization literacy. And so in this course, which is a <clears throat> six week course, uh, you come in and you work with other employees from other government agencies, but also um, corporate, and you get to uh, go through temporal topical geospatial network analysis, but you also get to work on uh, a so-called my project, where you can pick a project and then basically apply immediately different types of data analysis and visualization to your own data. And then there's a, a major project at the very end. So this way you um, get the theoretical knowledge, but you also get to apply it immediately. And as an engineer, I, I believe this is the best way to learn. But you can also, of course, just benefit from the theoretical uh, lectures there. Um, but ideally, you also get to have fun with uh, data and get to play with. So um, I think that was the ending of it. Um, yeah, um, so I'm happy to answer questions. Um, but um, let's see if there's anything in the commenting field also. Yeah, we have a lot of comments, questions. So thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Katie, I will remove the slides and let's begin the, the Q&A. Uh, and we have here 
already one very interesting question that goes in line with one that I had to ask you. So I will start by reading this one and then adding my comments. Um, so Sharon asks, how many of the maps, especially of the future, illustrate uncertainty? And if so, did you have a specific approach that you developed? So I, in your book, you have an interesting idea uh, the, that you called moderating forecasts. Uh, so um, you wrote like a, a weather forecast is more readily consumed and actionable when a meteorologist explains the weather patterns and dynamics. Uh, and you advocate for the use of same idea to build what you called the um, science forecast news. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But one of the things that uh, are usually missing in this um, weather forecast is the visualization of the uncertainty. And I was, I, I, I was, I had the same question: If you, how can we consider it when building our maps? The best way. Yeah, so I think there are two questions, right? How to visualize uncertainty and uh, be true to the data. And the other one is how to do that last step of translation that might still be needed because it's still not easy enough to understand for everybody. And so coming to the first question, people have invented many really neat ways to deal with uncertainty. In some cases, the data was so uncertain, for instance, in cartographic maps, early cartographic maps, um, that people just put clouds on top of continents where they couldn't connect the um, outlines, right? So if you look at old maps uh, and you go to Australia, for instance, you will see uh, typically lots of cloud formations um, up above uh, because people just didn't know how to um, really render that continent properly. Uh, in other cases, and I think that's what you are more interested in, is you have data, but you just also know that it's uncertain. And there were entire uh, workshops run on this. So people started to blur out, for instance, lines or made them uh, less visible because it was just less certain. So they tried to map um, certainty to uh, strong, bold outlines or very sharp outlines, whereas uh, those which were more uncertain were more blurred or not as, uh, as strong colored. And I think that's uh, an interesting line of, of work. Um, ultimately, of course, in statistics, you oftentimes have uh, confidence intervals, you have information on um, probabilities and, and, and just how valid your data is. Um, but I don't think we have um, a PhD work on this yet. And maybe one of you in the audience is going to write um, their PhD on it. I think it would be a, a highly read piece of work and there is quite a bit of early work on it, but it's not systematically brought together from what I know. If there are others here on the call which know about a good review, please um, just post it for us all. It is a highly uh, important uh, topic. Um, the next um, question was on how do you communicate uncertainty or also certainty about certain things to a general audience? Um, I believe we do have a lot of journalists, a lot of science communicators, which uh, have made that their passion to communicate um, science and technology developments to many. And you can just go to YouTube and see how many are following major technology trends and then every week or in some cases every other day bring out um, new videos that truly communicate or try to communicate what is going on in a, in a very entertaining way so that people come back and, and watch it again. Uh, in terms of data visualization and especially visualization of job market trajectories or uh, educational offerings and what exists now and what might exist in two, three years so that you can plan your trajectory through the job landscape I believe we have um, a little bit more to do. I think we don't yet have um, standard maps that are shown in the news, um, even though we could have them in the news. And it's important enough to understand that certain jobs very soon will not be available anymore for human labor. They will be taken over by uh, robots, by AI, by automation. And so it, it doesn't make much sense to train for them or to teach for them or to learn for them right now, because in one or two years, they won't exist anymore. You can't have that job as a human person. And that could totally be shown. And, and what we are 
currently doing is to bring some of those maps into science museums and into libraries, because that's places where people, general audiences are oftentimes go and go as a uh, family, and then the family together can discuss what to take away from such a map. Uh, but we don't have the connections to um, TV right now. So hopefully at some point, and maybe somebody here on this call has those connections and can um, propose that. And again, at the um, Futurium event, um, we um, had a number of these uh, pilots, uh, which are doing pilot broadcasts of science of te and technology. But um, those are pilots. Are, those are not yet run on, on nature TV channels. Okay, perfect. Um, so we have here another question. Like you as a teacher, maybe you can um, give us some, some ideas of um, so Luis Guimaraes uh, asks, uh, when it comes to visualizations, um, what tool programming language would you recommend for a beginner, a beginner, a beginner, sorry, and for a professional? That is a great question. And um, to be honest, I'm going to suggest um, using, um, in, in some cases, um, Excel is actually pretty good. If you can do pivot tables in there and then do some uh, color coding and do bar graphs and uh, line charts, that's what most people can read. Um, if you have more time, you might like to explore Tableau. If you're a student, you can get a free license. Otherwise, it might be okay to even get a license for Christmas. You know, it's, it's a great present for yourself to actually have fun with data. I know it's a bit, little bit more pricey. On the um, network science data side, we have a lot of free um, open uh, source tools such as Gephi and Cytoscape. Uh, those are great starting um, types. And um, I also really have enjoyed uh, Kepler uh, from the Uber uh, team. Uh, they just do amazing visualization. And I'm also happy to share some of those uh, links uh, later on. In fact, I had some links prepared and I can put them in the private chat, but I don't think I can um, get to the comments somehow. I don't know how to- We can do that. Thank you very much. Okay. And um, for a professional, maybe you wanna suggest? Yeah, so there are many, many good libraries. So we, for instance, use um, Vega a lot. Um, we also um, use in our professional data uh, visualization work, we use um, Angular data visualizations and user interfaces. And um, then use um, a lot of other libraries that other teams have uh, created. Uh, and it's, it's wonderful to see that much of the uh, data, about, but also the code and tutorials and uh, even online uh, courses on some of those tools are now becoming freely available for anyone to use. And that's really how it should be. So the code, the data and the education always are needed together. It's like a magic triangle. If you just have data and no code, that's not good. If you have data and code and no training, it's not good either. So having all three to come together is really the best. Okay, perfect. Uh, one question for Kuro, from Koro Doye. So Alberto Cairo made a statement today in which he opens with designing visualizations doesn't consist of applying any rules. What mm -hmm. do you think about the fixed rules in the field of database? Yeah, I really appreciate what Alberto Cairo has done in terms of his books, in terms of the MOOC he did, in terms of the many communities he brings together also really as a journalist and science communicator. Um, for rules, I think there are some rules which can be automatically applied, like you might be uh, familiar with the visualization Voyager that um, basically reads in data and then generates a bunch of visualization and then you can pick and choose and get a first understanding of the data. I think that's very, very valuable. Ultimately, if you have to serve a specific user need, oftentimes there's more fine tuning needed. And that's also where some metaphors come in, which computers don't yet understand, right? If you, for instance, have a certain metaphor that uh, can be applied to help communicate that, uh, for instance, some um, jobs won't be available for human labor anymore. How, what kind of metaphor is best there? Should it just become black on the um, landscape of science because the light has been turned off for human labor? Or should there be different metaphors that we use? So I think in these cases, we can't automatize this. We still need human beings. 
But um, there are many, many other areas where you can set up a workflow, which is basically a bunch of uh, rules that are applied to a, a data set that is guaranteed to, to have that format. And then this workflow is run 24 seven. And so whenever you need insight about that one data set, you just look at the visualizations. And these dashboards, they exist in many cases, and they are very, very useful. And so here you just apply that set of rules again and again and again, and the computer don't get bored of it. And you ultimately have um, this dashboard always up to date. And of course, if your data now becomes richer or changes or new data becomes available and gets merged into this data, and you want better data visualizations also, then in that moment, human labor is needed again. And um, you as a data visualization expert uh, get to fine tune it again. But as, as soon as something is understood, you can productize it. Okay, perfect. Let's see the next question. So this one might be a bit broad and like, I don't know how much time do we have still, but uh, what can we expect from augmented reality, virtual reality, Renata asks. Yeah, so there's a lot of hype about the metaverse right now. And in fact, uh, there's a team of eight uh, in our uh, center that um, now actively develops and enjoys um, mm -hmm. Oculus kind of VR data, 3D visualizations and develops data visualizations for those environments. We started to bring the exhibit maps into the metaverse. So you now can go into a virtual gallery. If you have an Oculus, I can, we, we can connect you and share a link there. And then you can explore those um, data maps uh, and the macroscopes in a kind of virtual gallery setting, uh, potentially with other um, friends and, and colleagues and, and museum visitors, if you wish. And I think that's very exciting because now you can start um, enjoying this um, museum exhibit together. But what doesn't yet exist is good libraries to bring data visualizations into these 3D environments. And so um, Andreas Böckler, who is a postdoc in our environment, he, is, he and some students, they are developing uh, libraries that uh, make that possible. And uh, maybe in the future, you might like to have one of those uh, presentations here. Definitely. Um, yes, so I have plenty of questions to ask, but uh, in maybe in, because of the time, we don't have much time left, I would end up with this question, what maps are yet to be drawn? So uh, yeah, we have this enormous amount of uh, work that you have shown in your three books. Um, uh, and yeah, and we are about to enter in this real uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. So what else do we need to still come up with? It's more philosophical question for the end. <laughs> I think there are lots of questions that we have about us ourselves, be it how we um, operate internally. So for instance, one project we are involved in is to map the human body at single cell resolution. 37 trillion cells, how do you create a map for this? And it's not just a static map, right? You want to understand function of our human body organs and, and functional tissue units, etc. And you want to zoom in all the way to something that might have gone wrong and, and try to resolve it and apply precision medicine. So how do you do that? So that's some that's a map I would love to draw. And so maybe that's my answer to this question. But obviously, there are many other data sets that are ripe for data visualization. And there are many algorithms that we would wish for. And maybe we need another hour to discuss this. Um, I'm not sure we can resolve this. But right now, maybe I just um, leave you with a link to um, one of the first um, visualizations of our human body. And, um, and just a link also to the um, effort. Um, there are really, there are many, many different communities working together to um, get um, us all a map of the um, world. So let me get that link. Um, mm -hmm. Please. Um, and I guess 
I did not prepare for that question, but I can. <laughs> good. That's uh, actually in, um, good to know. <laughs> yes. Um, Sign off a good question, I hope. Yes. Um, so let's see. I think I have to go back to um, there's some interesting interplay here. This. Maybe I can ask uh, another question while we are searching, just a quick one. Um, so how can we take into account the effort that it takes um, to really maintain these systems, these maps that we create? The, because I'm, I'm sure with all the curation that you, you do for the exhibition or for your books, uh, you might you might uh, find some links that, that are not working anymore, or visualizations that die. How can we um, think and create ways to maintain all this when we create our systems? So um, ultimately, um, so these are two questions. One is how to keep um, software tools uh, working, because as soon as somebody becomes an expert in it, if it then fails to um, be um, supported, that's a problem, right? People would like to use it still. And it's very expensive to um, have um, software tools kept up to date. And oftentimes it takes a lot of power, labor of love and, and a lot of um, exactly. big end work. To, to keep them up to date. So I deeply appreciate uh, people working on um, Gephi, for instance, or Cytoscape. And sometimes there's um, funding, but maybe not continuously. Um, for the so for keeping those tools um, alive, um, oftentimes it's good to have them done in a very modular way because then many different teams can come together and contribute different modules, like let's say a linguistic analysis and visualization or temporal topical analysis and visualization modules. Uh, and it's not just one team which has to do it all. And then the core has to be done in a way that you can plug and play these modules. And for Cytoscape, for instance, uh, OSGI has worked uh, very well and could work also for other tools. So OSGI is also work, uh, used by industry in uh, coffee machines and cars and other parts which need this plug and play architecture. Uh, for the exhibit, how to keep all these macroscopes um, alive, um, that's a totally different question, because here we build on the work of so many different macroscope makers, and oftentimes they might have had a really cool uh, research project going, created that macroscope, but then funding ended. And so here what we are doing is to create uh, videos of it, um, so that as soon as the software at some point doesn't work anymore because operating systems were updated, etc., then we at least can see the functionality that existed um, 10 years back in time, right? So oftentimes you cannot preserve a piece of, uh, of uh, code for so long. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay, perfect. So thank you so much, Dr. Katie. I will not take uh, much time uh, from you anymore. So thank you so much for joining us today and for the second time, taking the time to come again. Uh, yeah, let's keep in touch and hopefully, hopefully in the future we'll visit Lisbon and uh, we'll arrange a, a nice exhibi exhibition here. That would be wonderful. So um, feel free to also bring in um, Todd Theriold. Um, he would be able to give you a wonderful mm -hmm. curated um, course and, and tour through the exhibit. Perfect. All right. Um, thank you all. It's really bye nice bye. to talk and see you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, so go, going to the announcements, just uh, we are like over time now, so quickly into this awesome workshop coming on June 2022. 20, uh, so our dearest Silmesh will run a, a database workshop for the ones that need extra um, spark on, the, on their vi data visualization, so to really foster creativity and it will be awesome if it's with Salome, so I, I'm, I'm really happy to share this, uh, this workshop. Please um, go into the link uh, that you can see in the comments and enroll now. So regarding the next meetup, we'll have Barbara Emanuel. Um, she's a Brazilian designer and teacher uh, that will talk about rhetoric. So... Join us on June 28th. Um, we'll be here again to, for this awesome uh, meetup. Of course, 
I have to mention Pastel Data, our newsletter uh, in English and in Portuguese. Uh, it's released once uh, a month uh, by the end of the month. Um, usually in the, the last week. So if you're not subscribing yet to the newsletter, please visit our website and subscribe today. Another cool event coming on the database space. Uh, this on data and design meetup is running um, a book launch. Uh, so they are launching their book on visual, um, um, Visualizing complexity, that's the thing, that's the name, and uh, they are doing it on June 23, so join them, um, we'll be there as well to really um, see the, their, their book and more uh, content on, the, on it. Also, this awesome uh, event, Famous Friends 2022, Uh, um, it's a virtual event, uh, both in Portuguese and in English. Uh, it has really cool names. Um, so visit the website and uh, yeah, I think it will be great. I, will, um, I think you will see us there as well. So yeah, the, those were the, the news from us. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.